crowd in here. Hey, mums. I've got the uh, got the stalls built, put sawdust in the one stall, and uh, for the goats, the baby chickens to swap over there until we got them right in the other side of the property. There, on coop. And mums here used to be a high-end, award-winning dressage horse until I got a hold of her. And um, she always been kept in a box stall and controlled, <laughs> taken up for lessons and stuff. She never really got to go run around the field with a herd of horses and act like a natural horse. So, uh, but one thing that I did that came with me was just a regular shelter outside. She had to be in mud and stuff, you know. And uh, I really wanted to get this barn done to give these guys a nice, cozy, uh, warm, dry bedroom for the night, which she hasn't had for a while. So it's kind of funny. She went to that stall on her own uh, the other day, and all of a sudden she had this look on her face like, oh my god, this is so me, I can't wait. She knew right away it was her zone. Because then she went after the goats to try to kick them out of there, right? <laughs> but anyway, um, and this guy right here, well, he's always had the, he's always lived the cowboy world, right? He's always been up in the mountains running free and uh, dodging grizzly bears and wolves at nighttime and packing moose and elk, us. And, uh, and he, uh, so he doesn't know the difference. He couldn't care less if he, if he was in a stall or not. But, uh, Old mums, she can't wait. I can't wait to get her in there too. But anyway, a little more work. I guess got to do the pound on the walls. I made sure that I did a uh, a progress video from beginning to end, so it should be pretty cool at the end. And uh, I know I should probably hire people to do this, but I just I suck at that. I never. I always I always get, do a, do everything myself. That's why I'm probably tired all the time. But anyway. It is, I got the, you can hear a little bit of noise in the background, there's a pearl pig torch I got going on a bucket of water. And I've got uh, five turkeys I have to process today. And of course, guess who got connected to the damn things? So, a little bit of an issue this morning with, with time for turkeys to go where they're raised to go. We'll deal with that in a bit. Okay, listen, I'm not here to scratch you. We're here to get people's voices heard, so you guys stand here and listen to this, all right? Be polite. I don't know. I don't. I don't have any any that. I don't have any that are in mind when I come out here. I just know I got to get them all heard. So here's one titled "My Story." I'm a South Carolina native. In my years, I've lived in almost every corner slash region of this fine state. My first experience with elusive creatures when I was five years old with my grandfather in the Congaree Swamp. We were paddled canoe through the swamp just exploring when we came upon a black panther asleep in a tree, purring like a house cat. Holy cow. It appears huge to me, but I was a child. Don't, moms, don't do that, all right? Come on, get out of the way. Get out of here. We quietly, passed, we quietly passed by, and it napped soundly, unaware we had passed so closely. It's not working out, is it? It was a magical experience I'll never forget. In my many, many years and several dozen trips back, I've never seen one again. These beautiful animals are nearly extinct today, and is why our, sh our shared with NC NFL team has such a name, has such a name. My next experience is about a year later in the same swamp, in about the same area, where we came upon what appeared to be a bear wading through the swamp on its hind quarters, before climbing up to a small patch of land between several cypress trees. When we turned the bend, I switched my shotgun to the other shoulder, just in case. Keep going, keep going. somebody taking a shit in your face. When we turned the bend, I switched my shotgun to the other shoulder just in case. As we continued our turn, it became very, very clear this was not a bear, but I had nearly eight foot tall, hairy, soaking wet, and quite smelly Sasquatch. It was just watching us. No sounds that I recall, just standing there. I was terrified in a way I have never felt before or since. Mind you, we both had shotguns with mine, a pump action, 410, my grandfather 12 gauge. 
We never had any interest in hunting there, and we had only carried those in case we encountered a gator. Upon seeing me shift my gun to the other shoulder, my grandfather said in a shaky voice, Son, put your gun down and raise your paddle across your lap. From the sounds and the motion, my grandfather did the same. We continued the drift away, and when we were about 25 yards away, my grandfather said to just paddle slow and to leave my gun where it was. I did as he asked, and didn't look back in fear of follow. My grandfather, a few minutes later, said, he's gone. Nothing else was said, and the hairs of my neck seemed to stand on end for hours. When we got back to the truck and sat inside, about to leave, almost dark now, my grandfather said, Son, that was what some people call a swamp ape, but I don't like that name, and I call them forest people. But I'll never tell another soul I've seen them, and you should do the same. Just like that panther, let them be, and keep it to yourself. Whenever it's just us, we can talk about it. I listened to my grandfather and have never told a soul until I stumbled across your channel. Now some 40 plus years later, and living in the beautiful mountains, mountainous Walla Walla area, oh, Walhalla area, I began encountering several dark brown large Sasquatch moving through the edges of the tree line, always just outside of our range to get a clear sight. They are large and must be eight to 10 feet tall, as large as large black bear look to be the size of dogs in comparison. Upon exploring those areas in the bright part of the day, tree branches above my six foot height are bent and broken in a wide four to five foot game trail that reveals no prints, but just looks like something very heavy and large walked up the embankment slightly sliding rather than pressing firmly into the soil. Leaf litter and rocks. I repeatedly had these type of encounters in the 10 plus years I've lived in this part of the state. I will encounter scat once that appeared to be human like, but proudly larger and darker. That stench I remember as a young boy is often carried across the wind, but never again have I been as close as when I was a boy. I don't wish them harm, but I'd like to get a better look upon one in my years to come. I tried placing some game cameras well above a bear's reach and they always seem to get turned, missing, or clobbered. They can never get anything other than deer, black bear, bobcats, and once caught a glimpse of a coyote. The cams look to have been pried off nails and rotated on the straps by sticks or branches used like tools. Once I found pieces of bark from a tree that does not grow in the same area wedged into the casing cracks of the enclosure. Wedged into the casing cracks of the enclosure. The timing of the camera getting moved or broken before or after tells me the Sasquatch and the forest animals do not frequent the same area in a short time span like the animals do amongst themselves. I'm not sure what any of this means except over a nearly 50 year period. They were here, then still here now, and cover a very diverse range of environments. They appear intelligent and quite aware of the camera. My neighbor tells stories of seeing signs of and having rocks thrown at him over the years. But he's a hunter that often blurs the line on which property he hunts. But, I always appeared, but I've always appeared dismissive and changed the subject. I've hunted with bows and most often spears, but never frequently in a long gun, with a long gun. Maybe they not see me as a threat, or maybe they have some instinct that I wish them no harm. Sure, if you like, but keep my email address private, Bill. Wow, Bill, that's a freaking good... I should say good. I don't know if it's any, I don't know if any of this is actually good in the end. I haven't really come to a conclusion with that myself yet. But uh, that's quite the the good memory and the detail sharing with all of us. And I absolutely appreciate the fact that you uh, you shared with all of us for the first time here. Many you as, you, as you've seen, uh, many many people are coming up for the first time just in these past few months, right? I'm probably I'm pretty sure that uh, knee jerked you and giving you the confidence to share what you've experienced here as well. Just imagine how many of our grandfathers seen these things in the past and had the same reaction, the same, did the same thing. Kept their mouth shut, leave them be, leave me be, leave their family be, and I'm not saying anything unless somebody is with me and sees one as well. Imagine how many of our grandparents share that one.
I bet it's a lot, right? It's too bad our senior population isn't in control of what's going down today with our property, with our planet, don't you think? Probably our last of our, uh, the last generation of common sense, possibly. I'll bite my lip now. <laughs> what we have here is another one. A bunch of pictures included. Look at all that red. Hi, Steve. I've sent this several times, however, I've never heard my encounters read. I know you're busy on, and I thank you for what you do for us. P.S. I have another crazy encounter I, to me by, sent to me by a close friend. I would like, if you would like me to send it, that one, I will as well. Thanks so much, Steve. All right, thanks for that quick note. There was a space between every single letter in that little note. <laughs> okay, thank God, the rest is easy to read. Here we go. Good morning, Steve. My name is also Steve, and I'd like to keep my last name out of this email. I've been listening to your YouTube channel for quite some time, and I'm thankful for what you do for folks like myself. A little bit about me before I get into my encounters. I'm a retired sergeant from my county sheriff department in the state of Michigan. I served my community for 25 years, retired young in 2012. I come from a long line of hunters, trappers, and fishermen. I myself spent some time in the backcountry hunting, fishing, and running a decent trap line. I spent nights stuck in the woods with my hounds after being overcome with fog and no compass. I know darkness and things that go bump in the night. Aha. Fog. It's your worst enemy. I don't care who you are or where you are. If you hit fog in the timber, you're done. <laughs> you're not going to go anywhere in the right direction. You need something to tell you which way to come. North is, right? That's the only thing that creeps me out. Fog, timber, or else when we're way up on a high plateau with horses, late in the day and then the fog comes in. Ooh, that's very, very bad. First encounter, I think it was about 2007. My cousin and I were running our coon hounds behind my house. It was a very windy night, and hearing the hounds was tough. We hunted until about 1 a.m. and decided to call it quits. As we entered the southwest corner of my property with two other dogs, which mine had been on bear, cats, coon, and hay and coyotes with a passion, I also had a 16, a 15 month old pup. As we stopped, knelt down to take a break, all at once the pup looked deep into my, into my swamp and his hair stood up and he began to growl, growl. What surprised me was the fact that the older dogs looked that way too, but just stared in that direction. This was odd to me, so I just barely turned my red hat lamp, headlamp on, expecting to see some eye shine. I saw nothing. About a minute later, the pup turned 180 degrees and did the same thing. I know it was windy but we never heard, seen, or smelled a thing. I just kept that pocket. I just kind of pocketed that experience in the back of my mind as an odd experience. Second encounter. I lease hunting property, property about eight miles from my home. One night coon hunting, I turned, on, I turned one of my hounds loose down a tree line fence row that is about 700 yards long. By the time I reached the end of this fence row, which had, to say, which had say, beans planted in the field each side, I had killed four raccoon. What, not wanting to carry them all around on the rest of the hunt, I piled them up the end of the fence row. 30 yards from the end of this fence row, fence row is a 40-acre woodlot. I shot two more raccoons within 40 yards of where I piled up the other four raccoons. I left them in a pile as well. I continued hunting the woods and other adjacent woods and killed three more raccoons. I called my hound over to where I piled up those other four raccoons and they were gone. I was dumbfounded. I went to check on the other two and they were also gone. Steve, I know those raccoon were graveyard dead when I piled them up. I did hear different bird sounds coming from the tree, the three woodlots, which seemed a little odd at 2 a.m. Again, I packed, I pocketed, oh, again, I packed that experience up as odd. Third encounter, in the fall 2017, a friend of mine and I drove to a small lake about 20 miles from my home. The lake is about 12 acre lake and is on a secluded dirt road with no houses within a quarter mile. This lake only has parking room for about three vehicles. We arrived about 5.30 p.m. to pan fish. The boat launch is blocked off so that you have to carry your boat down this narrow muck channel about eight yards wide. We loaded our boat at the launch and pushed the boat out to the deeper water and began using a trawler motor. This is a fishing lake only. When we came back to shore, we were losing light rapidly. We carried our stuff up to the truck which is only the only vehicle there. 
When we walked back down to get the boat, we heard some brush snap in the thick swamp. This is about 50 yards wide between the road and the lake. I looked at my buddy, who was a man's man and not afraid of squat. We shrugged our shoulders to acknowledge that we both heard something. We carried the boat up to the truck and loaded it into the back of my truck. As we began to load our fishing gear into the boat, which was in the back of the truck, we heard heavy bipedal walking in that swampy area that parallels the road for a quarter mile. The only light that we had was the light on our phones, which sucked. We couldn't see a thing. However, whatever it was continued to walk toward the lake like it was sneaking. Then it would walk back toward the road and stop right in line with us. It started to get that uneasy feeling, so I told my buddy, let's go. Mind you, as a police officer, I've had very few days that I have not had a gun on my hip anywhere I go. My buddy stopped talking to me not too many years after that. When I asked him what he thought it was, we heard that night, what, wait a minute, my buddy stopped talking to me not too many years after that. That sucks ass. When I asked him what he thought it was that we heard that night, a mutual friend said he had talked to my fishing buddy and he said whatever it was in that swampy woods made him feel very small. Again, another odd incident that I packed away in my memory. Fourth account, June 14th, 2018. I went back to the same lake alone just before daylight to bluegill fish the beds. I was the only vehicle there and only one on the water. I unloaded and launched my boat. I had my limit at 10 by 10 a.m. I never heard a vehicle come down the dirt road or saw anyone up by the launch. This lake is surrounded by swampy shoreline that you cannot see through. As I pulled my boat up to the launch area, I looked over the edge of the two different sized footprints in the grassy muck. At first I thought, how dumb could someone be to be barefoot down here in this little narrow launch with busted glass, hooks, and a whole host of things to cut your feet on. I then noticed how wide the footprints were. As I stepped out of the boat, I noticed my footprint was narrower than the smallest track. I also noticed that at 5'11", 215 pounds, I didn't sink in nearly as deep. In fact, I barely indented the ground. I pulled out my phone and quickly snapped three photos. I didn't lay a tape measure down for the comparison as I kind of felt the urge to keep moving along. I will say I wear a size 11 tennis shoe. The larger track was, track was also wider than my shoe and about two inches longer. I think what also struck me as being so odd is how wide both these bare footprints were. I'll attach the photos at the end. On the smaller print, you can see the partial indentation of my tennis shoe on the right side. Fifth encounter. A week later, I went back to that lake fishing. I also brought my wife along with a kayak, as she likes to kayak more than fish. I told her about the two previous encounters over there, she kind of shrugged it off. As I was fishing at one end of the 12 acre lake, my wife was about 300 yards away. All of a sudden, the swampy area between the roads and the lake. Go away, go away, come on. Get out of there. Where were we? Sorry about that. All of a sudden, All of a sudden, in the swampy area between the road and the lake, a huge tree came crashing down as if it were pushed over. Steve, there wasn't a breath of air moving that day or at that time. You and I know as hunters, we're always watching the treetops, weeds, or anything to keep fresh in our mind wind direction. We always do this for advantage while hunting. Steve, you would have sworn my wife had a 100 horsepower motor on her kayak. She paddled that kayak to my boat, all wide-eyed, and said, Sasquatch. I said most likely. Needless to say, we didn't wait till dark to leap. Sixth encounter. Summer 2018, a buddy was helping me cut some firewood. We had, to park, we had to park along the road and carry our saws, chains, gas, and oil about 300 yards off the road to a woodlot. There was field corn planted along the road that was about eight feet high. I was walking in front as we approached the woods. I had a small path cut in the woods from the previous season. My plan was to cut the firewood and come haul it out after the crops were harvested. As we entered the woods, my buddy sat down and was setting his fuel and oil down. I was looking behind him, about 75 yards in an area that has some huge sugar maple trees about 4 to 5 feet across. I noticed a lot of saplings between me and this particular tree. 
I noticed a dark brown object slash patch at the base of the tree. As soon as I set my chainsaw down and began to take the extra chains off from around my neck, I noticed the dark object stood up to about four feet high and kind of snuck around the back side of the tree and vanished. I never mentioned it to my buddy with me, but I walked on down to the tree. I never seen a track or smelled anything odd. Whatever it was, only stood partial upright and slipped around the back side of the tree and vanished. I hunted the woods so many times, and when the deer bust in, they don't just slip away, they bolt and crash. I would say about 800 yards of the other end of these woods, I have heard what I thought were wood knocks while slipping into turkey on early morning slash still dark. Again, another odd experience. Seventh encounter. May of this year, 2021. My daughter came home to turkey hunt. I had already tagged out and had been scouting birds for her. We were at my lease property where my raccoons vanished. I drove my daughter down the fence row in my gas-powered Polaris Ranger. After we got out of the Ranger, she loaded her shotgun. It was just on the cusp of daylight and had a pop-up blind set up near a creek. I knew the birds were roosted in my lease woods and if they followed their normal pattern, they would be headed for our way shortly after daybreak. As my daughter and I began walking down the edge of the field near where the two lone rac raccoons vanished in my encounter too, my daughter grabbed my arm. Her eyes were pretty wide. I said, what? She said, can't you hear that? I said, what? She said, something is paralleling us in the woods. I turned and continued walking towards the creek to get to our pop-up. About 75 yards into the walk, she grabbed my arm again and said, can't you hear that? Something's following us. When we walk, it walks. When we stop, it stops. It keeps breaking branches as it walks. I acknowledged her and continued to the blind. I knew in the blind that we'd be able to see anything approaching us from all directions. Steve, there was no other hunters in those woods. I have leased that property 30 years and arrested one trespasser and written several tickets. Folks don't chance it anymore. For whatever reason, those turkeys refused to go into those woods that day. Later that day on the walk back to the ranger, she asked me what I thought it was that followed us this morning. I looked in her eye and I said, a squatch. She got quiet. Many years ago, I was hunting there and last light after the deer had passed beneath me and headed out to feed, I got down out of my stand. As the deer head west, I headed north to the edge of the woods along the field edge. When I got to the edge, I heard a deep roar that I've never heard before just southeast of my stand. I assumed it might have been the elusive buck roar that I've never heard in 46 years of being in the woods. Now I question whether I might have screwed up something's hunt. Another odd experience. Steve, in the drive home with my daughter after turkey hunting, she was quiet for a while. She then asked, do you really think that was a Sasquatch? I said, I do. I asked her what animal would stay just inside the woods as we drove a motored ranger all the way down the field. What animal would stay in those woods that close to our scent, blowing directly at them and not run off? What animal stalks a person or parallels someone while breaking bush and is bipedal? What person can see another person walking in the woods in the dark with no flashlight, especially with someone they are paralleling that is armed? I then proceeded to tell her about all my experiences, and when I told her about the, ha the hounds down back behind my house, she said that two years ago, when she was back there deer hunting by herself, she's 30 now, that she noticed something dark kept peeking from above a tree, from behind a tree. She said it did this several times, and it was quick to get back behind the tree when she looked through her scope and the gun. I think she knows we are not alone now, that there's something out there. I will say this, I too have had times where my hair stands up going into my stands, but somehow I just push through and block it out. I keep my head on a swivel and I'm always aware of my surroundings. I know that even though the little pea shooter I carry would most likely piss him off, I guarantee I won't go without a fight. Maybe that is why my encounters have been subtle. I'm glad that I haven't given up the love of being out there, and now that I am retired, I'm out there more than before. Sorry. My email is so long, Steve. Thank you again for your platform to inform and take care, Steve. All right, man, thanks for that. That's definitely a heavy foot with toes. No getting out of that one. Crystal clear. Well, I, mean, I can see your shoe in dent left side of that. Barely made a freaking dent as usual, right? And there you go. Another career law enforcement officer shares experiences and the photos.
another and another and another. You gotta wonder with this pace of, of the people becoming stronger, more confident, and gaining courage and speaking out loud and accepting all this shit's fact, which it is, unfortunately, mostly. Um, I wonder what's coming. Don't you ever start wondering what's coming? Something's coming. Something's coming. I can feel it. Something is coming. And I'm talking about with this topic right now, not besides other things coming with other topics and plans today, but I just got this feeling something's coming. I think the way we've gone at it here with all the people, everybody being heard, respected, nobody being promoted and sensationalized and looked to for all the answers, which is key. Look what's happened since all those, those so-called big names have been kicked into the curb. Look what's happened. Look at the numbers. Look at how many people want to talk. Look at how many people have talked for the first time. Case closed. Proven fact. We're doing it right, finally. Right? We're finally doing it right. And that, that sure has my curiosity burning. What's coming next? Someone's coming. Somebody is, somebody's, somebody or somebody's uh, are on their way here. They're on their way, eventually. Steadily, they're, they're coming. And they're going to shed some light. Although we do have a handful of people right now who are, um, they make promises to share. Not holding my breath as usual, we'll see who comes. Got a lot of contacts out there sharing lots of stuff. A lot of, a lot of well-informed people who are still gun shy and scared. I don't know why, well, I guess I understand why, but I'm not. Just send it to me, I'll share it. Just get it out. There's too many people here, and it's too powerful of a thing. The people, all of you, are very, very powerful together. It's a huge force. But anyway, I got some things to do. Lots of work to do. And I will go back down to the river again. These things are getting kind of weird down there. You gotta admit, it's just a little bit weird. But it is what it is, and it is directly right in the middle of one of the most popular zones for experiences for years and years and years. Does it freak me out? I'm not freaked out as in, I've accepted this fact years ago. I had to, I had it thrown in my face. So, um, I'm not amazed. I don't need to seek out proof. I don't need to take pictures and go, oh my God, look at this, look at this, look at that, but look at that. But what could have done that? What do you think did this? I'm over it. They're here, get on with it. So, um, I, I do not, change any of my personal habits, obviously, unless something really gets in my face and lets me know what I'm doing is absolutely wrong. That, that would definitely do it. Except that one time years ago in the Pemberton Valley, I was way up there, and that thing, I was looking for these beings intentionally, and that thing beat the side of that cottonwood with that, I'll call it a log, it had to be a log, and beat the shit out of that tree. And it was only about to give me a couple hundred yards away. Did you see it? You could hear it hitting the, the underbrush and all the willow before the impact on the log. And that was it for me. I'm good. I mean, that was a, you had to have been there. I probably can't deliver it and describe it perfectly, but it was, a, that was an in your face F you. How I received that, and I'm done. I haven't, I haven't once ever tried to intentionally. Uh, seek these things out since. I have intentionally tried to do the opposite. <laughs> Just by letting them know. I've shared that already. But. So that being said, yeah, I will go back down to the river. And I'll keep going down there. I'm going to go fishing down there. I'm going to make videos down there. And if this escalates any further, well, it does. We'll see what happens, but at least you guys will be there with me, right? Anyway, babbling. Gotta get going. Dr. Jordan.